everybody. I'm still at the Sony Kando event and it's been quite the event. I'm having a great time and uh, getting a chance to catch up with a lot of old friends and new friends. Uh, this is my last interview today and I'm going to be talking to Don Smith. Don, Kevin. a pleasure meeting you and uh, I've been following you for years. Um, you have an amazing career out there and um, we're going to talk a little bit about how Don's career has changed from uh, doing sports and other things in the fine art landscape as well as his transition from the DSLR and why uh, he's moved to mirrorless. So, um, Don, let's let's start out. We're both old guys in this business, and we've been yes. around doing this uh, for quite a while. Um, and we've both had good careers in photography. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it's to me, it's one of the the happiest places in my life, and it saves me a ton on therapy bills. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but let's talk about you. You started photography at what age and doing what? I picked up my first digital SLR, I believe, when I was 12 or 13. It was it was a present from my parents. They yeah. we had a family friend who had a digital SLR system, and they saw me. I couldn't put the camera <laughs> down. I was enamored by it. Got it as a birthday present, and I kind of grew up in this area of Monterey, Carmel. I live a little inland from here, so uh, you know Ansel was in this area, and. I just started running around shooting and having no idea what I was doing, but I started really in landscape photography, very bad landscape photography. <laughs> but that was uh, that was my introduction to photography was way back in high school. And did you have a teacher in high school to talk to? You, you know, I didn't. It uh, I had what I'd call a few mentors, people that lived in the area that were professional photographers that knew I had an interest. And they would great, you know, they would share their knowledge with me, which I've always tried to pass on now. Um, that's my way of saying thank you to those people. Uh, but I didn't take any formal training until I got to college. And I realized at that point I had a in real interest in doing the sports photography and I kind of had a knack at doing it. I think back, this, this is before the days, yeah. we're saying we're old guys, this is before the days when we had any of this auto stuff or auto focus. I know, you focus manually and you're lucky to get three frames a second. So you, <laughs> you ran around with your 400, 300 2.8s, 400 2.8s, 600 F4s, and uh, tried to shoot a, a football game, and you either had that ability to stay with it, hand-eye focus, or you didn't. And for some reason, that was just something I was blessed with. It was nothing yeah. I could go out and train to do. I either had it or I didn't. Well, I actually think it was training, because you know, when before autofocus came, you know, who would ever thought we would have had autofocus? And you yeah. know, you just got to be good at knowing, you know, predicting which way it was going to go, and and you know, move that uh, focus ring that yeah, way. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, I knew, and I would practice. I, <laughs> it sounds funny. I'd go out in the backyard and practice with my yeah. dog, and I'd, I'd at the time would have somebody throw a bone and just let that dog run around, and I would, I got to know if I turned the lens this way, I was pulling focus. If I went oh. that way, I was, you know, or if I was shifting sideways to just leave it alone, and. and so in a way, I was training myself. And we were carrying three and four cameras with mm -hmm. us sometimes. And <laughs> yes. one monopod if we were lucky. I mean, well, our backs have got to be like so degenerated. It's uh, yeah, you were, we were just oh. talking about that. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, knock on wood, we can keep going. So you've, you've done a lot of cool sports work in, in your day and you did mm -hmm. uh, some Sports Illustrated yes. stuff. But somewhere you made the transition to want to get back to you know, yeah. what, what motivated that? You went back to landscape. Uh, you know what it was? It was honestly uh, because I got kind of branded as a baseball photographer and a football photographer. And I can remember, especially living out here in the Bay Area, one o'clock starts in Oakland, California. It's probably some of the ugliest light you'll ever see, maybe <laughs> yeah. next to Southern California. And we would have these five o'clock afternoon games every once in a while, and I'd be so excited that we were gonna get Lights this low light, light yeah, yeah. and shoot through the shadows and let the players <laughs> run into this, these shafts of sunlight. And when I finally got back out to doing the landscape, it really came through a vacation I had in the Eastern Sierra. And a gentleman who I've read a lot of books, his name was Galen Rowell, and oh, he, he God, passed Galen. away. Yeah, 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 I'm sure you knew he him. He passed away doing what he liked. He, though, and he really, I can remember his gallery in Bishop. My wife and I and our two little boys were young at the time, and I was transfixed just looking at Galen's pictures and thinking he did all this with a 35 millimeter. And, and it was on all a rope about, sometimes. Yeah, and on I mean, a rope geez, and being you know, mobile. God. And I thought for the first time, I really don't need a four by five or an eight by 10 to be a serious land photographer, landscape photographer. I can do this with my existing equipment. And, he, and Galen was obviously all about the light sure. on the edges of the day. Yeah, yeah. And I think he, he was such a huge influence on me along with Ansel, obviously. 
Yeah, there was there was a lot of good good guys back then, and yeah, you know, it was a, a slower craft. I mean, yeah, you know, we didn't was. move as fast, and yeah. you know, exposures had to count. Yeah, um, that's true. Uh, we we tell people in our workshops nowadays every time you used to make a click. That was an investment out of your pocket. Yeah, it was. Nowadays, you make a click, it's an investment in knowledge. So we don't teach to rapid fire, but be thinking about every frame you're making as, as we used to do in the olden days when we were shooting film. Yeah, you know, even at our old age, um, we, we discover new things. Mm. Uh, I do and teach a lot of workshops with Art Wolf. Mm -hmm. and, uh, a lot of times what we look at these days is not just the broad landscape, but the abstract and the image inside the image, the picture in yeah. the picture. Um, what it, what's interesting, and let's do a little generational switch and then we'll come back to some other things. You know, and I don't know if it's like we're the old guys in, in the neighborhood these days, but I, I so much remember for me making the print what was what completed photography. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, if you shot negatives, you're not going to say, well, hey, look at this negative, you know, it's yeah. like you can't, yeah. you, you had to make a print. Yes. And you had to be good at making a print. And of course, this is what Ansel preached and everybody else. I mean, part of it was having the, the knowledge to capture that image properly. And uh, the other part was being able to take what you have on that negative and get it on a piece of paper properly. Exactly. And we massaged prints like we do in uh, Lightroom, Capture One, and whatnot in Photoshop these days. So, you know, we still do dodging and burning, but it, there's a generation now, you know, that are taking pictures that that's where it stops. That's where it stops. It ends and, up on a screen. And uh, the printing process, really, people like Charlie Kramer um, are still the masters at teaching and to tap into their knowledge and, and to understand how they've translate it. I printed a lot. I had three dark <laughs> black and white dark rooms along the way. Yep. And then at that point, I was getting away from the fine art and really starting seriously to go into the sports. And when I started shooting um, with the magazine, especially Sports Illustrated, we shot all chrome. Yeah. And you, you had a miss factor of maybe a half a stop either side. I know. Isn't yeah, it? Do, I, do I write for the Time Life Labs, push it a half stop, pull it a half stop? Uh, you know, we were talking earlier. There was no you, forgiveness. No forgiveness. Your stomach would churn <laughs> until, for me, being out here on the West Coast, 9, 9.30 came and went, and if I didn't get that phone call, I knew the shoot oh. was good and, and the exposures were on the mark. And uh, histograms came along in digital cameras when I fell in love oh, with them just... because it's all there for you. It's all math. And there's a lot more dynamic range and you oh, know, area to recover. Exactly. Yeah. You know, nothing like Kodachrome 64 and even 25. <laughs> 25 remember, I you had 25. to get right dead nuts on to get that exposure exactly. right. But there was nothing like it. It was like a painting. I remember the Kodachrome. Oh, I remember yeah. getting in in the long boxes where each slide was, you know, separated and not there. And, you know, it was with the looper. I mean, put it in the ectographic projector to, you know, oh, God. And that in itself was, uh, to me, I still re relive these experiences of being able, that anticipation when that box of chromes would come oh, yeah. back. Uh, or even being in the dark room with the old tray, you know, yep. the developer, and starting to see that print emerge. And now it's so instant, and it, it's good in one way, but the, it'll never replace those experiences uh, of doing that. And my wife used to laugh at me. I have to say this: 27 years of marriage. When we were dating, the first time she came over to my house and she opened up my <laughs> refrigerator, it and it was filled with <laughs> film and a couple of diet cokes, oh, and that's wow. all that was in there. And she <laughs> well, that's won't all let we me. Needed. That, yeah. She won't let me forget that till this day. Yeah, I had a film Diet Coke and <laughs> yeah. a dark room with my big guy. I had Morant speakers in it. Oh, and yeah. My, yeah. You know, duct taped over where the you know, the lights and the dial were. We would were. live in those dark oh, rooms it was for just hours a, and hours and hours. And luckily, we got a chance to experience it. But, you know, quite frankly, you know, we've also adapted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there... We are in the golden age. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, these guys that are entering into it just take it for granted. But, man, when you consider what we're doing these days, what we can go out in the field and shoot and come back with, there's never been a better time no. to be a photographer. Maybe yeah. probably that's why there's so many damn photographers out there. Right I think now, but, so. <laughs> but, and, and the thought that uh, everybody can do it. Yeah. You know, but it, I, it's it, nice to see people enjoying photography. Yes. Now, you, you run a lot of workshops mm -hmm. and you, you teach a lot. So tell me some of the workshops and locations you go to. Well, uh, I started out domestically and actually I started, um, was trained by a gentleman named Gary Hart, who's a Sony artisan who um, you just met. Yep. And he really kind of took me under his wing and said, I'm going to start running Yosemite workshops. You want to do it? And I, 
I kind of at the time said, I'll do one, no contracts. <laughs> I'll see how I like it. That's led to, I think I'm starting my 13th or 14th year of running workshops. And actually my first workshop on my own was right here in the Big Sur area. Oh, and great. I still run till this day two workshops a year. I've expanded out now um, for the tail end of my career here, kind of coming down the home stretch. I really want to do international workshops. And I've added three, New Zealand, uh, Namibia this summer, and we, Ron Modra and myself, an Exports Illustrated shooter, just got back from Patagonia about three weeks ago, and we're going to be offering one there next February. Yeah, amazing place. We would, that's it is. Actually, you know, I've avoided the, the domestic ones a lot, you know, except for maybe the Palouse area. Um, you know, sometimes I'll fill out the forms and do Death Valley and, yeah. you know, some of those, yeah. but most of mine are, are out-of-country workshops and, you know, on ship-based workshops in places that are yeah. really hard to get to, but... Um, you know, it's 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 almost discouraging sometimes because of many of the workshop locations we go to, you know, they used to be all of our own, and now you know we're standing on bridges and all these different places with you know 50 photographers. I, I, I'm chuckling because I'm thinking immediately when you said that Mesa Arch and Canyonlands oh, National yeah, Park. Got the Zion I, Bridge and everything. Oh, <laughs> I've actually switched that workshop to. I still love doing the workshop there. But I switched it into January, and what a difference. Nice. What, and it took me three years of the rangers out there I've gotten to know convincing me this is a time you should be out here. We have to offer the iconic places, mm -hmm. but we try to pride ourselves in going beyond that and finding the less off-the-beaten-path places that we've worked hard to try to find yeah. that photographers don't know about. Or they yeah, I have, my, I have my stashes. I'm willing to share yeah. with friends like you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just picked your brain about yeah. one of those places. I find it a lot nicer just to have a smaller group. I'm doing this now in Antarctica trips where I just do, I sell by the Zodiac. So I'll mm -hmm. sell a Zodiac that I'll photograph and then, you know, wait, sell another Zodiac for the second instructor if we do it that way. Um, and that allows us to, to be with our customers the whole time and really you know, listen to what they, they, they need help with and then, you know, follow through with uh, delivering on that. But, you know, we get a chance to talk photography, you know, at dinner and on the boat and mm -hmm. the ship and every place mm -hmm. else. And it's uh, maybe at my age, it's just becoming a, a much <laughs> nicer way of doing things. I think so, it is. Uh, I, I, I could see myself starting the trend in that direction also. And it's, I, th I believe it's more immersive for the client too, because they're there Yep. However long the workshop is, my internationals run 10 days and 11 nights, and I just we just immerse ourselves from sunup to sundown in photography, and we do some training along the way when in the middle of the day, but it's primarily all about them and all about their shooting. That's all it has to be. It Other has to be, sure. And, and uh, you know, I have so many of my customers that are running their own workshops now too, which you know, I think I counted 38 or 40 wow. last time I looked. It's, yeah, we're starting. You know, to it's get like, that oh, now. cow, really? Come on, I took you there. You know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's the way it is. Well, yeah. you know, talk hardware for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, we both come back from the DSLR days and the manual yeah. focus days and. Um, what got you into digital and specifically Sony? You know, I'm going to uh, have to tell you the truth. It was a gentleman named uh, a, a colleague. I, I, we, we know each other from the Yosemite area, Michael Fry. Huh. And I there happened to land on Michael's blog one day when he wrote about his experience with an A7R. And I'm thinking, this is strange because I don't really remember Michael being one to write a lot about gear. But it was enough that I had B&H send a camera out and I took it to a workshop I was doing in Grand Tetons, and I was out on the, the pre-run, of what I call the pre-run right. portion of the workshop, uh, a three-day stretch I go on, and I can remember just being enamored by the dynamic range of that sensor in that camera, and I was using the meta sure. bones at the time. And, and adapting Sony didn't, Canon lenses. Yeah, and adapting all my Canon lenses, because Sony didn't yep. really have a lineup, not anything near what not they have on, nowadays. Right. And I can remember calling B&H back and said, whatever you're charging me, charge me because you're not getting this camera back. Uh, and I, I pretty much, from, well, from that day forward, 100% of my landscape work was done with the A7R line, and I'm currently now with the A7R3. That A7R3, the new one, the bigger battery and all mm. the, the features they put into it, just amazing. And for the G Master glass, oh, what do you think of that? Well, the G Master is really made to optimize with these new sensors, as you know, the resolving power. Yeah. The edge to edge sharpness, I mean, I was, and we were back in the days, we used to run around with five cameras and a prime for every camera because, you know, you never yeah, used a zoom. Zooms. And nowadays, I don't hesitate putting the zooms on there because they're so razor sharp. They have the edge sharpness that I'm looking for. 
and uh, they just, I, I can cover, my bag is a 12 to 24. Um, 24, I just swapped out the 2470. I'm not getting rid of that lens, it's beautiful. Oh, the G-Man, yeah, but, but I'll 105. put a 105 when I'm traveling in, and then a 100, 400. Exactly! And a 1X converter, and that's my bag, really. Um, and I can go anywhere in the world with that bag, and I'm pretty well covered. I mean, think landscape. about that. We can do you know, 12 millimeters mm -hmm. all the way up if, with the 1.4 to 560 millimeters with three lenses. Yeah, or we four really lenses. can. Yeah, you know, it depends. But that 24 to 105 turned out to be that's so lightweight and it's so nice. It's I don't know why lens. it didn't become a G Master because I mean, really, I, I said oh, this is going to be as good as a 24 to 70. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I think it was better. Oh my heavens! I think and I'll, it is. you know, and then I'll throw in like uh, a 90 macro and, yeah. and a couple of extension tubes. I have specialty ones when, like I, when we go out for stuff. Yeah. We know but we want to my basic landscape yep. kit and I can keep it fairly light and I, and I do keep a, an A9 in the bag. Um, I was proud of the fact that I was part of a small team that helped to get to develop that camera and uh, just absolutely love that camera That's for amazing, shooting any it? wildlife or anything 20 that frames a second, no blackout silent. Mm -hmm. I mean I actually turn the audio on just so I have audio. You know, yeah. It comes out of a little speaker or something. But, yeah. Uh, I boy. used to photograph golf tournaments and you know um, you could just think of the times. I remember right over here at Pebble Beach one time in a U.S. Open where Jack Nicklaus was lining up on a crucial putt on the final day. And, you know, a horde of photographers and a, and a shutter goes off. Uh. And he was gracious. He backed away and he says, I'm going to count the three. Everybody get their shot. Move back in over the putt. This is a man trying to win the U.S. Open on the back nine yeah, on Sunday. Is. And everybody went, you know, brrr. And then he says, okay, guys, don't shoot until after I hit the putt. Please. Yeah, and I mean, he sank the putt for the birdie. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember if he won the U.S. Open. I think that was the year actually Tom Watson oh, really? pulled out on the 17th hole. It's kind of a famous, uh, famous time in golf for the golf viewers out there. What, what do you think is holding the, uh, the other two guys back? Um, <laughs> the fact that uh, they haven't really seen the future of what was going on here. Boy, it's almost like the old yellow box story. Isn't yeah, it, it really, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, one of the things I've prided myself with um, is that, you know, I tend to try to see what's, what's coming down the pipe and what's real. And I, I was one of the very early adopters to digital, and I was one of the very early adopters to mirrorless. And, um, you know, I think at some point you have to, to, to just kind of ask yourself, is this where the future of photography is going? And I'd, I'd rather be on this side of the curve than trying to catch up. Uh, you know, we said that many years ago, Michael Reichman, the founder of the site, he and I would, mm -hmm. you know, say, well, you know, where's Nikon and Canon? We were looking at like the Olympus at that mm -hmm. time and the early Sony A7. And, you know, then Fuji came along with, you know, their X-T1. Yeah, and, which I actually you know, owned for uh, about six months. Yeah, so, and, yeah. you know, but even like a saw the light yeah. made an SL, I mean, it's heavy as a, 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 you know, a brick, <laughs> but, you know, what they did it, and it's actually a pretty darn cool camera in, I, in so many ways. I think it's amazed the industry. And I can only, you know, from a sports photographer's end, and I, I shouldn't be talking out of class here, but yeah, no, it's okay. once we get the long glass out, and I know the 400 2.8's coming out sometime yeah. this summer, um, a serious sports photographer making their living, that's all that's holding them back right yeah. now. They want to see that 300 2.8 glass, 400 2.8, the 600 4s, the 500 4s, and the wildlife people. I, I don't want to exclude no, them. No, that's... And once, I know Sony's working hard on those lenses, and once those lenses come out, there's really no reason. No, I think it's uh, game over and game change. But then mm -hmm. again, we hear that both of those other companies are, you know, working hard on a on a on a solution too. But yes. they're going to have to kind of go nuclear if they're going to make it. <sighs> Sony's so far out ahead of uh, the game at this and, point. And you know, they they probably have a chessboard saying, "Well, we, we'll wait till they come out with it, and then we've got this." <laughs> yes. You know, so they'll lob one back. Anyway, you know, I, I wrote an article a while back calling you know if I was a betting man, and it it said you know where I'd put my money and. Uh, you know, we made a big deal about putting our money with Sony, and of course, I think Fuji's mm -hmm. done some innovations too. So, I think so you know, too. not to knock them off, but they're you know APCS, and you know, I think they were very smart to go to medium format, and they're going to do very well in that line too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, progression and innovation is what it's all about, exactly. and uh, it's going to be fun. I would really be honored sometime to meet somewhere in the field with you, and I hope our paths oh, cross, great. and maybe do a workshop yep. together, or go shooting together. 
um, you know, we share a lot of the similarities and it's just yeah. sometimes been too long to get to know some of these guys out there. But it was an honor and I really appreciate you sitting down and uh, talking to us today. We could probably talk a lot longer, but yeah. then we'd probably lose a lot of viewers. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe tonight at the barbecue yeah, well, with, a, with a beer or two. <laughs> but for everybody out there, I'm going to put uh, the information below so you can get to uh, Don's site and uh, um, you'll be able to see his pictures, his Instagram and everything will be linked down below. So check it out, take a look at it. You have a YouTube channel also. Uh, I, uh, videos, I, I do. I, I don't, I've learned through Condo here. I took a class on YouTube <laughs> so and I need to get much, much more active on my YouTube yeah, site, you which I plan to do moving yeah. forward. So yeah. uh, check it all out. And uh, Don, real pleasure again. Kevin, and thank you very much. And I, I really appreciate what you do for the industry with this website. I oh, think thanks. it's an invaluable uh, website for people to go to. It's a passion, you know. Uh, yeah. Michael and I were best friends, and he kind of, you know, just kind of, it just came and worked for him, and he mm. just, it was his love, and it's become my love, and yeah. uh, it, you know, photography's been the only thing I know. So well, you do a fantastic a job fit. with what you're doing. So yeah. great, it's appreciated. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget, you can. Uh, do the subscribe button below to subscribe to our channel. And of course, the little ding dong button if you want to be active or notified when we come out with a new video. And thank you very much for watching. Don, thank you again. Thank you. And we'll see you guys on the Loomis Landscape.